I'm Owen Big Land. This is the Inside Edge video blog. Okay, an interesting article that was in the Globe and Mail last month, written by Carrie Gold. She's the local kind of Vancouver real estate reporter for the Globe and Mail. And it was entitled Mortgaged Until I Die. For many, that's okay. You could look it up on the Globe and Mail, just put that title in by Carrie Gold. Now, this is something that I also read in the Wall Street Journal probably about four months ago. And it's it talks about, you know, how Canadians now with our low interest that we're in and yeah interest rates are going to go up but we're still in an absolute rental or a mortgage dreamland and will be for a long time to come as I'm going to point out here. Canadians now do not want to pay off their mortgage. I'm in that same boat with my rental properties as well as my principal residence. Many are actually re-upping taking out lines of credit or actually not even taking out the line of credit, just redoing the entire mortgage at a much better rate than a line of credit would and just keeping the mortgage till you die or well into your retirement age. Because when you can borrow at 1.3, 1.4, 1.8%, why not pull that money out of your house, put it into other investments that can get you a much better return? I mean, gee, you could buy a couple hundred shares of Bell Canada, even though it's had an incredible run here the last year, it's still yielding five and a half percent, three times what your mortgage rate is. Plus, you're going to get some capital gain on it. So I'll just read you a couple of little segments out of here. You know, it talked about um, the days of the mortgage burning party, because that was big 10 or 15 years ago, where people paid at the end of the year a 10% lump sum and, you know, took out a 25-year mortgage, but, you know, the goal was to pay it off in 8 or 10 years. That made a lot of sense when interest rates were at 9, 10, 11, 12%. I tell you guys about my first mortgages were at 14, 15% doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you can get a variable rate right now at 1.3 and you can invest your money in other areas and earn far better return. Um, you know, it's now been replaced with an acceptance of long-term borrowing, often well into retirement and even for life. Uh, no longer anxious to pay them off, many homeowners reduce mortgage and uh, refinance mortgages and reset the clock. Um, people view it as a piggy bank because of the cost because of the cost of homes is so high, says Matthew Oldberg. He's a mortgage broker. They think they can pay three percent on the one point five million dollar house, and if we refinance, pull out our money, uh, pull some money out, reinvest it in something else, uh, we can make more money. Um, and a lot of people are going that way. Yeah, well, three percent. Geez, I'm not even anywhere near three percent. Uh, I think it still makes sense at three or three and a half or four for sure. But I've had variable rates running here for the last six months at 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 1 1.25. They've creeped up here with that quarter point increase, but I'm currently paying about 1.4%. So I'm nowhere near 3%. So this is the same thing we were talking about in the Wall Street Journal as well. When you've got these low interest rates like we're at, yeah, why? There's no hurry to pay off a mortgage, especially in Canada here. You know, uh, and especially if, if, if it's a rental property, of course, you absolutely don't. But even in the states where you can deduct the mortgage interest on your principal residence, you can't do that here. Even there, uh, they had some experts on the Wall Street Journal that saying it doesn't make much sense. You've got a variable rate at 1.3. You can invest that in, in a good ETF, well-balanced ETF, and earn a, a much nicer uh, return than what you're currently paying on the mortgage. Plus, I think with most people, in, myself included, we're, we're not over leveraging here. And that's important for me to point out because people get all spooked when you start talking about taking on too much debt and using leverage and refinancing mortgages and adding more onto them. For the most part, most of these people are able, if interest rates did start to get away on them, cut a check and knock a hundred or two hundred thousand off. You know, I can do that without any problem at all. You know, I could pay off all my mortgages if I want to, but why would I? When I'm getting these incredible low rates, you can use it, leverage it to buy other properties or put it into the stock market or whatever. And I think you're going to start to see, you know, this is one of the reasons why too, I think our inventory is so low. People are holding tight because they don't need to sell the house to access the two or three million dollars they might have in, in equity in the home. Or even a one bedroom condo that they bought 10 years ago, they might have $600,000 of equity. They don't have to sell it to access it. 
They can take out a line of credit at a very low rate or just refinance the whole thing at 1.3 or 1.4 percent. And again, it's probably having a bit of an effect on, on the low inventory. Last couple of things here. Talk about two 180 degree turns from what was going on a little while ago here. First one, which I have to laugh at, if you guys saw in the paper here, it's been in the Globe and in the Vancouver Sun and on the news here, the TV, which I don't really watch, but I saw it on YouTube. David Eby, our, our housing minister here, uh, or sorry, is he our finance minister, uh, housing minister, David Eby, he's now done a 180 degree turn now and he's out there on all the media outlets saying that, uh, uh, you know, a, a massive increase in housing supply is the preferred route over more taxes or over massive tax increases. Oh yeah, no kidding. Well, what have I been talking about on my blog here for the last five or six years? that taxes aren't the answer, but that isn't what Mr. Eby was saying two years ago, or Carol James or Horgan. They were saying that the answer to our housing, crazy uh, high housing prices was to curb demand. They didn't do anything about supply then. Their solution to it was let's curb demand in the form of taxes. Let's bump the, uh, let's add, uh, in incorporate a BC spec tax Let's uh, increase the foreign buyer's tax. Let's have a war, and I mean an absolute war on landlords because they think all landlords are multi-multi-millionaires, which they aren't. Sure, some are, but many aren't. They're just hardworking people that have put their money to work and bought a one-bedroom condo to try and get their money working for them. Let's hit them with a rent freeze for two years. And then he had the audacity, these guys, to let us have a 1.5% increase when inflation now is running at 6 or 7%. I said it wouldn't work and it would have the reverse effect, which it has. Housing now, condos, detached townhomes are at all-time record highs and the rental market is brutal right now. It's always been brutal in Vancouver, but it is just horrible. I've done a couple of blogs on it. Stay tuned for more blogs. If you're a renter right now, ouch, it is tough out there. You've got to get out of that renter treadmill. Now he does a complete 180. He's talking about he's rejecting calls for more housing taxes. Well, <laughs> I don't know what else could he do? He, the NDP and the city of Vancouver has thrown everything but the kitchen sink to try and work the demand side. I don't know what's left short of getting rid of the principal residence exemption, which is a federal issue, which is a sacred cow. It won't happen. I think the federal government will probably bump up our capital gains tax from 50 to 75. I think it's only a matter of time, but that'd be about it. What else can you do? Uh, we'd be bordering into, you know, full on socialism if they went further than that. I guess, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, rental uh, caps on what you can raise rent even without the tenant leaving. So rent control, crazy. Another 180, final 180 degree turn is uh, the today's uh, March 23rd, I'm doing this blog right now, the March 23rd issue of the Wall Street Journal, right on the front page, here's the headline, retirees won't settle for sleepy suburbs, they're moving to the big city. And it's a story, this is the second one that the Wall Street Journal has done, and I think, I'm sure Vancouver's done some here, the local papers, about people you know, moving back into the city. Of course they're moving back into the city. COVID was temporary. And uh, for sure, there were some people that, uh, and I had clients, that went from a condo to a detached house on the suburbs, they had kids, it was a great move for them. There was also some people though that, you know, got out of the downtown, moved out to the suburbs, uh, thinking that they were never gonna have to work back in an office downtown and they're gonna work from home forever. That wasn't a good move. And now they're finding out that the commute is killing them. Let's throw in $2 a liter gas and everything else. And that's what this story in the Wall Street Journal, the cities are, are where people wanna live. It is. Vancouver is never gonna lose its luster long-term. It's not. Um, everything is here. Uh, you've got the seawall, you've got world-class restaurants, entertainment. For me, I'm only going to train at the best uh, fitness center in BC, which is Equinox. There's only one in the province. So this is where I want to live. And this is where a lot of these retirees, young people, urban centers 
it's been proven that living in the cities has a lot of benefits. Look at the, one of them being the price of gas and not having to commute. So this is exactly what I said two years ago when the media, of course, was telling you that the cities are going to be dead forever. Nobody's ever going to want to live in Manhattan. Nobody's ever going to want to live in Vancouver or any major city, London. Everything was going to hollow out and it just simply wasn't true. COVID was a temporary blip and people, offices are back opening again. Uh, you know, there's a, I've done a blog blogs before on living, being able to walk to work, walk to the restaurants, walk to go have a drink. Nothing wrong with living out in the suburbs in a large detached home. It's fantastic and I've done that myself too. I'm at an age now where I didn't want, don't want that, but at one time it was wonderful for me. And it's wonderful for many people, especially if you want to have kids and you could afford it and get into a detached home and maybe you are working remotely or hopefully your office is out in the suburbs but having to commute is going to be tough. But, you know, as I predicted, you know, the city is where the offices are, the jobs, the amenities, the restaurants, the entertainment. It's a pretty nice lifestyle. It's not for everybody, but that's why you're seeing the one bedroom condo prices at all time highs again, and rental rates now for a typical one bedroom running at about 2,300 a month. And I think that's going to get uh, higher as we move into the next few years here. I'm Owen Big One. As always, thanks for watching. I'll see you next week.